<laughs> I know this is going to come as a surprise to some people. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you're going to be shocked to discover something that you hadn't thought of before. That maybe you hadn't realized or you just hadn't learned yet. You know, little things. Things that you hadn't thought of. That you hadn't considered or even planned on. We all have them. You know, we all have these ideas that until we put them into practice, we really don't know how much we either believe in something or don't believe in something until it's been tested, until it's been tried, as it were. And each one of us are challenged by that because, you see, there's this idea of what we want to believe in, and then there's the reality of what we actually do believe in. And then there's kind of the in-between where we want to believe, but we really don't believe. And so sometimes that gets into conflict, you know, where you really don't know quite where you're at until you're actually tested by it. <laughs> That's why I always tell people, you know, it's nice to get compliments. It's nice to see when people, you know, enjoy your company or whatever. But when the chips are down, that's when I can tell someone who's really in the faith, so to speak, or when someone's just going through the motions. Because it's easy to be a Christian when everything's Christian-like. But when it's not, then it's more obvious who the Christians are. Or when they're being challenged, you know, like in some point that they hadn't thought of. For instance, like, you know, people right now are into this whole violence thing. You know, they think they need to go out and get bigger guns and more protection and do this, that, and the other thing. When the reality is if God can't protect you, who can <laughs> you need to get closer to God than you need to get closer to your strength of might or build up your power or you know take some self-defense course. The greatest defense is God's offense. And when God goes on the offensive, watch out, because we are living in the latter days. But you know, I was thinking about this thing called life, you know, that we live every day. I was thinking about how some people really don't live their life out as much as they could. They don't enjoy it like they should. They don't realize that the struggles are normal. The challenges are meant to be. These things are supposed to happen to you and to me. They are causes and reasons why we do become Christians in the first place. So that we can shine, so that we could show, so that we could be obvious who we are. We're the people with the answer. Did you know that? Yeah, really. When people are hopeless, we have hope. When people are heartless or gutless, we have the heart and the guts. We have the strength of character to say, no, I'm not going to do that but I'm not going to prevent you from doing what you think is right. I'm just not going to go with you on it. I choose to go a better way. I choose to live a better life. I choose to put myself into God's hands and let Him lead me in the way I should go. Now you may go another way and that's fine. You can choose what you do want to do and what you may enjoy, but for me I choose a different way. And each one of us every day have to make that choice. We have to decide whether we live up to what we think we believe in or whether we measure up to the things we actually are. Whether we take responsibility for our own actions, our own words, our own deeds. Because there's a lot of people that like to deny that they did something right after they did it, which is really just being a child. Or they like to blame someone else for everything that goes on in their life when the reality is they're the ones who are in the life. So who are you going to blame? You didn't have to react to it. <laughs> 
You see, God has designed our lives with a purpose and a plan. And we either operate in it and enjoy it and accept it for what it is, or we could pretend like we're not living. We could pretend like, no, the sun's not shining. We could pretend like, no, the birds aren't singing. We could pretend like, no, the plants aren't blooming. And we could whine and cry and moan and groan about what we don't have and what we can't get and what isn't there. Or we could take our choices to God in prayer. We could take, as it were, our faith to see if it's real and talk to God about it. We could find out if this thing called Christianity is true and then act like it. Because if we don't, God won't choose us. He'll lose us to the Great Tribulation where we'll either prove we will follow him by death or we'll prove we won't follow him by going through that temporary life and being condemned. No one need be condemned, really. Everyone can find salvation. Everyone has known the message and has heard it at some point in time in their life. They have known God. Romans tells us that. At some point in time, every single person, living, breathing, and alive, has known God in some way. Now, whether they chose to follow Him, that was their own decision-making process. A servant of Jesus Christ you call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Being made free from sin, become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Thou art no more a servant, but you are a son. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. For, brethren, you have been called into and unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. It's so easy to take this thing called grace and abuse it, because, after all, we've been given the freedom from sin. We don't have to sin. We don't have to be caught up in addictions. We don't have to be an alcoholic or a drug addict. We don't have to be a sexual pervert or a sensual reality check. Or we don't have to be worldly or carnal. We can be spiritual. We can be. But what we choose to be is our own decision. You and I have that ability. God wants to give us His Spirit to enable us to make those choices correctly. If we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God, then we'll walk in the Spirit and we'll learn peace, we'll learn love, and we will enjoy life. But if we choose not to walk in the Spirit, but we walk in the flesh, then we will be depressed, discouraged, beaten down, always seeking and finding those things that only cause frustration, consternation. And yet, if we will go through the trial and tribulation of possibly doing God's will, when we pass through that time of testing, we come out with greater peace than we've ever known, a greater love than we could ever have experienced in our life, a joy that cannot be taken away from us. And that's the part of enjoying life that God wants us to attain to. We may not have started off learning when we should have from birth, but since we have been born again, we have begun to learn anew. We have begun to reprogram our thinking. We have begun to change our mind to reflect that which Jesus said we could have, and that was to become a son of God. 
If you looked at your life today, would you declare yourself to be a son of God? Would you? Would you say to people around you, hey, you may not understand this, but hey, I'm a son of God. Would people laugh at you? Would people chuckle? Would they smirk? Would they deride you? Would they tell you you're full of it? You see, at some point in time, we need to be moving in that direction. So if you choose today to become like Jesus, if you want to be like what God wants you to be, a son of God, then you have to move in that direction. You have to think in that way. You have to start considering who you are so that you will become what you are by His work in you. Otherwise, you're going to spend your life frustrated at life because this life is not what it's all about. You have started a journey that is going to end in perfection. You will be made perfect, even as He is perfect. But until you get there, you will be either moving upward, onward, inward, and outward manifesting Jesus, or you will be frustrated constantly at everything that you try to do seems to not work out in the person you want to be or God intended you to become. So, if I could give you a little lesson. This is a little tiny cherry tomato. Now, this cherry tomato, it didn't suddenly bloom overnight. As a matter of fact, this little cherry tomato came from those plants that were about this big when I showed them to you before. And then the plants grew and grew and they had to be watered. They had to be given sunshine. They had to be protected from the wind sometimes when a windstorm came. They had to be protected from the cold when a chill came and would have frozen the roots and killed the plant. But because I took care of them, and because I spent my time preparing the plant to bear fruit, gradually the plant gave out little yellow blossoms that were beautiful. They were pretty. Matter of fact, they look kind of nice. I still see some over there. But sooner or later, the blossom had to die in order for the fruit to be born. Because you see, where this green is, these little leaves, and the stem, that's where the blossom was. And you can't see the blossom anymore because it's died. The same thing is true when you're born again of the Spirit. As soon as you become born again, you blossom in life. You look like, oh wow, I'm in love. You look like, oh, I want Jesus. Oh, you look like, oh, so much like the blossoming of God. Because your life has suddenly bloomed because you're born of the Spirit. But you see, until that blossom dies, it really doesn't bear fruit. It just looks good, but you can't eat a flower. But you can eat the fruit. And you know, that fruit didn't grow overnight. It took time. But in his time, and in his way, God is able to take these blossoms and make them into fruit. God will do that in your life. Your life will bear fruit. Though at first you think you're bearing fruit because you see the blossom and you smell the roses, so to speak, and you think, oh, life is wonderful because it's all blossoming. Everything is coming up roses. But you see, God wants to bear fruit in you. So if he wants to bear more fruit, he may prune you. If he wants to bear some fruit, he may let your blossom die so that the fruit may live. And once that blossom has died to itself, it can produce fruit. Now in my tomato plant, not every one of those blossoms turns into a fruit. Only certain ones that the plant and God and life have determined will bear fruit and grow to its fullness. And those don't start and stop. 
once that process begins and that little tiny little green nudule comes out where that blossom was it grows completely to fruition so as soon as the fruit begins to come up alive in you don't be surprised if God continues to work until you bear much fruit for even the plant that Jesus passed by that did not bear fruit the fig tree he said dig a trench around it fertilize it put some water there protect it and then we'll come back and see if it bears fruit in time as you yield your life to God as you let him lead the way your life will become fruitful as long as you keep doing it <laughs> his way and not your way. After all, you are a son of God.